So Jonah is asked to go to a place that he does not want to go to. He doesn't go. Instead, he goes the opposite direction. He goes, catches a boat, God sends a storm. Jonah says, hey, throw me overboard so the storm will stop, does it. And so now God catches him in a big fish, a modern day Uber to take him where he really should go. It's amazing. So that's where we're at right now. We're picking up in chapter two. So if you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there while I'm talking. And today, it's interesting for me to be preaching on Jonah because I remember 15 years ago, I was talking with my sister and I wasn't walking with the Lord. I wasn't a Christian at the time. And we were just, we had we'd grown up in a Christian church, but we were at that time in our lives really doubting the word of God. And especially, I remember talking about doubting the Word of God, and I remember talking specifically about doubting Jonah, about this story of Jonah and the whale, about how could something like this happen. I thought the story to be a tad fishy. But this story, it's often referred to, and many of us have heard this story, as Jonah and the whale. We've all heard this story. We've all heard this title. But more importantly, this story is not about a fish. This story is about a loving father relentlessly pursuing his rebellious son. It's a story more than physical survival. It's a story about spiritual revival. That's what this story is really about. So Jonah, chapter 2, verse 1, it should be behind me if you guys don't have your Bibles. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, that's basically hell itself, I cried out, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and all your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet, yet God, you brought, you brought me up out of a life You brought me up, life from the pit. O Lord my God, when my life was fading away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. On that note, let's pray. Father, we thank you so, so much for your surprising grace. Lord God, here is a man that has run away from you, that has left your presence. And then you, God, in your great love and your great mercy, have reached out to Jonah. Lord, you have pursued him and you have made a way to bring him back into your presence. So, Lord God, we thank you that not only is this truth true for Jonah, but this is true for us today too. So, God, this morning, if I do my job correctly, Lord, I pray that your word is preached faithfully, that you are lifted high, and that we are convicted of sin, but yet left encouraged. We love you, Lord, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So starting in verse 1, going back to verse 1, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. You notice it says here, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. God. I love that it says his God. Despite running, 
the Lord was still his God. God will not lose any of his people. And that is encouraging news to us. Our God is not just a God of second chances, as the Veggie Tales Jonah says. Our God is a God of endless chances. 70 times 70 chances. Amen? Psalms 145, 8, 9 says, The Lord is gracious and merciful. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. And this is our Lord to Jonah. He's gracious, he's merciful, he's kind, despite his rebellion. It's good to know that we cannot out-sin, out-sin God's grace. Grace is something that is sufficient for us as Christians. It's all we need. It's the air for us. He cleans up my mess by grace as I walk forward in life. God says, run away, hide from me, and I will seek you out. Disobey, and I will forgive it, and I will use it for my glory. Have you done something evil? Joseph says, what you meant for evil, God has used for good. God says, do you worship other things besides me? He says, I know you will. Actually, I know the exact moment, the exact minute, the exact hour that you are going to worship something else besides me. But I still have saved you, and I still have welcomed you, and I still have called you my son and my daughter. I love you. Nothing that we do can change that. It's one way, love. And here's Jonah. Either he's hard-hearted from being in the belly of a fish for three days, or he expected he was going to die. And he's surprised by God's grace. But Jonah, to be able to run from God, you wonder what's been going on in his life. Has he been worn out from ministry battle? Maybe from serving the Lord. So he's taken off his armor and he's believing lies from the enemy. Jonah has lost sight that God is good. He was a runaway and he's fleeing and he's going the opposite way. He's trying to escape from the presence of God. God says go. Jonah says what? No. Jonah is trying to escape and What's interesting about this is when Jonah started off in his running, I'm sure he couldn't imagine how far he would go. Sin always takes us farther than we ever thought we'd go, and it costs us more than we ever thought it would cost us. Jonah has lost sight, too. He's lost perspective that God was good, hasn't he? He's fleeing the opposite way. But you know, I can relate to Jonah. I don't know if you guys see yourself in this story at all, but I feel like if this story was brought into the modern day language and it was specifically for our church, we changed the book name to Eric, to my name. I'm Jonah. I read this story and I see so many parallels from when I got ordained a year ago. How God has called me to be a pastor. And has so many times throughout the last year, I've wanted to run. Far too often, I see my calling as a shepherd as too much. I sinfully and I selfishly believe in my mind things like, this is above my pay grade. This costs too much. It would be so much easier to, I mean, fill in the blank, anything. It's far too uncomfortable to answer the call. I think thoughts like, what's in it for me? I think, God, you're too demanding. Like, really? You want all of me? You want all of my time, all of my energy, all of my money? You want all of it. And I'm believing lies. 
that my God is a big, demanding God, and it's all about me, me, me. But in that moment, the best thing happens to me. Once I get to that place, I realize that everything else has failed me. All the other things, those thoughts living in my mind and the conclusion I come to at that end result, it's empty. And I realize, like Solomon realized, that everything else besides the Lord is meaningless. Everything else falls short of the glory of God. And I get shown that what I was pursuing was a present. It looked great, but opening it, there's nothing inside. It's completely empty. And God's like this with me. Go ahead, try running. Try sleeping at the bottom of the boat. Try ignoring your calling. Try life without me. Try to do it for a while. But you'll come running back because you'll realize that there is not life apart from me. Jared Wilson says it like this. Jesus won't be our absolute treasure until we are out of options. Jesus won't look beautiful until we realize that everything else is a far second to him. I ask myself, once I get to the end myself, is why would I even try to outrun this God? How can I even do that? I mean, you have the words of eternal life. You are God. There is no life apart from you. And despite Jonah's running, he gets to the end of himself. And he realizes that God's grace is surprising. That but God, that despite Jonah, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved him, made him alive. Made him alive. So picking up in verse 2, we see Jonah for the first time a turning point in this man's life through his running, through his sleeping, through his apathy, through his disobedience, gets to a place where he says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried, and you heard my voice. Here, Jonah is desperate. He's where he needs to be. Like a lot of us, when we're desperate, we finally, finally, Turn to God. We may be turning away from our sin at times, only to turn and face another sin. Here Jonah is turning away from his sin, and he is kneeling before his God. It's his first sign of repentance, because God's kindness breaks Jonah's heart. His kindness leads him to repentance. He's starting to realize that God is good again. He calls out to God, doing what? Praying the Psalms. He's actually praying the Bible. We're seeing what this man is actually capable of. And he says, this poor man cried. This, we sing this song. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me. The Lord saved me. Are you suffering today? Are you going through something today? James says, then let him pray. Call out to the Lord, as Jonah did. Call out to the Lord, your God. Are you scared to go to your Nineveh today? God says, be strong and courageous. It's me the Lord your God who goes before you. I will be with you. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Are you stressed out today? Call out to the Lord as Jonah does. He says, all who are weary, all who are heavy laden, come to me 
and I will give you rest. How many times have you called out to the Lord in your time of need and he's answered you? We need that on our walls. We need that in front of our face to remind us of the goodness of our God. God hears our prayers, church. He heard Jonah, and he hears us. No matter where you are at, and this could be the craziest setting for a prayer, for a heart change in the history of the world, and the belly of a fish. But he listens. It's proof that he listens, and he hears our prayers no matter where we're at, no matter how disobedient we've been. Our God is patient. Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is patient towards you. Why? So that you will repent. You will turn back to him. He's patient with you. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just, I underestimate God's grace. I underestimate his patience. And I'm seeing him as not those things. Our God is patient and our God is kind. And by God showing Jonah these things, his surprising grace, we see that Jonah, we see that Jonah could actually repent. We see this man change. Listen to his prayer going on in verse 3. He says, For you cast me. And he's giving God credit for his heart change. He's grateful. You cast me. Are you grateful for God casting you into your sea, quote unquote? Jonah's grateful for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and your waves and your billows passed over me. He is calling it your waves. This was you, God, doing this to me. In verse 4, then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head and the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. And at this moment, Jonah is actually literally being physically brought low. And he's spiritually being brought low. And here's a turning point where he says, Yet you brought up my life from the pit. Acknowledging again what God has done with him. You brought my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Then my life was fainting away, and I remembered the Lord. See, he's remembering the discipline of the Lord is good. He's remembering God's grace on his life. And my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And thank God that salvation belongs to the Lord and not Jonah. He does not save himself. He wouldn't have been saved. He couldn't swim that far to shore. That God saved and redeemed Jonah with a fish. But God has saved and God has redeemed us by Jesus Christ. By grace you have been saved. By his blood you have been saved. Here Jonah is finally getting the right perspective. He's seeing grace for what it is. And grace, this love that cares, that stoops, and that rescues. This grace where God reaches down to us, to the people who are in rebellion against him. This grace that is a one-way love. So Jonah here is seeing himself poor. He's seeing himself for who he really is. And he's seeing the richness of his God. Eventually, he gets there after three days. 
Jonah thanks God for the discipline. He acknowledges what is, God has done and how he has brought his life up from the pit. He's saying, Jonah, you don't save yourself. Salvation belongs to me. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So when I was younger, as I was telling you guys, the story of Jonah was hard to believe. This idea of a fish swallowing a man, keeping him alive and spitting him up on dry land was something that was hard to believe for me. And so as I was going through the sermon and studying this for the first time in my adult life, really in-depthly studying the story of Jonah, I started to become more amazed with something else. I started to become more amazed with God's grace. I started to become more amazed thinking through my life of rebellion, through my running, through my sleeping, through my lack of caring about the things that God has for me. Through all of that, God has been faithful. I have been unfaithful. He has been faithful. That is more unbelievable than a big, amazing God choosing to use a fish. There's light, and there'd be light. Perfect timing. So in your notes, you'll see a quote from Charles Spurgeon that says this. It says, Repentance will not make you see Christ. But to see Christ, will what? will give you repentance. Repentance isn't just turning away from sin, but it's turning from sin and turning towards the Lord. And once you see that, sin just starts to fall off. Hebrews 12 says it better than me. It says it like this. It says, Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to you. Run with endurance the race that is set before you, looking to Jesus. Eyes on the prize. Look into Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame for you, became shame for you, and is seated now at the right hand of God, the Father. Are you seeing Christ clear today? Are you seeing him for who he truly is? My point is, once you see him clearly, and you know this because a lot of you have experienced this, when you're seeing Christ clearly, sin is falling off. And before you know, weeks go by and you're, you're looking back going, what has happened to me? And it's because you were so fixed, fixated on the glory of God. So if we don't do that, Repentance won't happen. We'll be, at this, we'll be stuck at the bottom of the water like Jonah. If we don't or won't repent, the waters will close over us. It will take our lives. The deep will surround us, and the weeds will stay wrapped around our heads. And this leads us to a place when we see God for who he is, when we have eyes fixed on the glory of God, it leads us to worship. It leads us to worship just like it leads Jonah to worship. And I don't know if you noticed this, but Jonah's prayer sounds so much like David's prayers. Psalm 34, verse 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. It says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, eyes fixed on the Lord, radiant, sin is falling off, and they shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried. This sounds like Jonah. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and he saved him out of his troubles, This is a man that has been surprised by God's grace. And this grace turns and spurs worship. It spurs thankfulness. It it spurs a praise for being rescued. Before we can proclaim 
Jesus. Before we can go make disciples, before we can make disciples locally and globally, before we can do any of that, two things must happen. We must see the riches of God's grace, and we must confess that we are spiritually bankrupt, that we need him, that salvation belongs to him and to him alone. And that's where Jonah is now, where he is declaring the goodness of God and that salvation belongs to the Lord. He's ready to be used. He's ready for mission. In verse 10, God is saying, okay, Jonah, it looks like your heart has changed, so now it looks like you're ready for mission. And so, verse 10 says, the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. How fun is our God? You're ready, huh? Ready for mission? Cool. All right, you ready to obey? Well, here we go. And hurls him. Awesome. His ways are not our ways. This is the last time and the last way I'm sure Jonah ever expected to be redeemed. I'm sure God had changed his heart in a lot of other ways, but this had to be the craziest way. But he is back in the saddle again. He is on mission. Is he perfect? No. But he's ready. He's given a second chance. Remember that our God is a God of more than second chances. Jonah has been surprised by grace, and now he's ready to proclaim that grace that has been shown to him. Have you been shown that grace? Are you ready to proclaim that grace? I'm going to say in closing, but I'm a little nervous because this go, could go a little longer than an in closing type moment. But in closing... This morning, I wanted to give everyone just a, a chance for repentance. Just give everyone a chance to examine your heart. And I wanted to ask some questions. Because my job as a pastor is to encourage you guys in the Word of God. It's to point you to Jesus. And it's also to convict you of sin. So that you will run back to the Lord, your God, your maker. So you may be well aware of where you're at this morning. I'm sure most of us do. You may be running, and you may not care that you're running. Start by getting prayer today. Start by pulling someone aside and asking them to pray for you. Call out to the Lord, your God, as Jonah did. Do you need to repent today? You need to repent of something. That means to turn away from your sin. You may want to change this morning. Something little, something big, but you don't know how. First question I'll ask, are you surprised by grace? Are you seeing Christ clear? If not, reach out for prayer and confess where you're at. Admit where you're at. Be transparent, be honest, be accountable. And test this. And another thing I want you to test is test not doing it. Do I really want you to do that? No. But if you don't do it, do me a favor and write down all the thoughts you have from this moment that you don't do it throughout your entire week. Write a journal about it and how miserable you were. And the next time you repent, write a journal about how God redeemed your heart through it so you can look back on it and you can see on paper what God really does through repentance. It works. Test it. Are you like Jonah? Are you running? God is calling you into something. He's called you maybe to be a mom, maybe a dad, maybe a husband, maybe a wife. Are you leading your family well? Do you need to repent? Maybe you're Nineveh. Maybe where God is asking you to go is something super small, like just having your neighbor over for dinner. 
He wants you to share your faith, and he wants you to start somewhere. Maybe just start somewhere. God is saying, arise, go to Nineveh. But are you responding with what I respond with sometimes? That's above my pay grade. Are you sleeping? Because sometimes we're running, and other times we're just flat out, don't care, sleeping. We're apathetic. We're hearing the words of the gospel. We're hearing the power of the word of God, and it's not even moving us to do anything. Are you asleep in the light? You've been saved, you've been equipped, but now you're sitting and you're sleeping. Your friends and your family don't know the Lord and you've spent more time not spending with them, but your devices. Where are you being apathetic? And not to make you feel guilt-ridden this morning, but where have you been apathetic so that you can find freedom? No matter where you're at this morning, there is good news because Jonah was in complete, complete rebellion against God. And by God's grace, he saved him. By God's grace, he brought him from out of the pit because salvation belongs not to you and not to your performance, but to the Lord. It's great news this morning that we are not the ones who sustain our lives, but he is the one moving in and through us. So this morning, as I wrap up, let us magnify the Lord and exalt his name. Let's do this together, church. Let's be on mission together, repenting and confessing our sins to one another and proclaiming the goodness of our God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your amazing grace, for your amazing love, for your amazing patience, your kindness, your goodness. Lord, you are slow to anger. You're abounding in love. And God, we so often have just a faulty picture of you. Lord, this morning I pray that you would adjust our eye lenses, Lord, our gospel lenses that we so often get fogged up and skewed, that, Lord God, you would clear those glasses up this morning, that you would let us see you as the author and the perfecter of our faith, so that we would run this race with endurance as we keep our eyes on the prize, and sin would just completely start to fall off of us, Lord. I pray this morning that we would see your riches for what they really are, Lord, and we would see ourselves as completely in need of you. You're such a good God, and we, Lord, just come before you this morning by your grace, admitting that we need you and want to magnify your name, Lord. So I pray for everyone here that if they're struggling and they're dealing with anything, Lord God, that they need to repent of, that they would this morning get prayer in the next few minutes, that they wouldn't be scared, but Lord God, that they would find freedom this morning. In your name we pray, amen, amen.